when mankind arrives in the world, life begins. And so Rosh Hashanah marks the beginning of life, the beginning of the story of mankind, which is the real story of life. Life begins with us. On the first day of life, God was here in a revealed way. And it's the connection that, that existed on that first day of life. It was very clear to Adam and Eve in the very beginning that life meant a life where we're here and God is here. And that's real life. Today, that reality is hidden from us, on, on, at least in a, in a way to feel it and we actually see it. But that doesn't mean that that reality changed. Reality is, and life really is, a life that's us in God's world together. That's real life. But things block that from us, things confuse us, things cause us to feel, at least from our perspective, distant from Hashem. The truth is, Hashem never really goes anywhere. The real question is, where are we? Not where is Hashem. Hashem is hiding, sure, on one level, but He's here to be found when you look. And if you don't find when you look, so you're supposed to look a little bit harder. And so God is here, He never left, but He is hiding, which creates a challenge for us. If you work, to find him, you will. And if you don't work to find him, then you'll go through life thinking that he's not here and miss out on all what you can gain from realizing that this is not a world that, that God left. It's a world that God put into our hands to see what we will do when he hides. If God was right in front of us and he wants to see if we're going to listen, so what kind of challenge is that? Of course we're not going to do anything because God's right in front of us. So why is God hiding? He wants to see what we're really made of. He wants to see who we really are. Because without the challenge, he, he'll never know what we are, who we are, if we're really going to listen or not. So God is here, but He hides because He wants to really see what we're made of. And will we follow or not? From our own free will, not because we're forced. Okay, so, but, but with this scenario that He created where He hides and we don't see Him, so He creates the potential, like these kids did, to, to do what we're not supposed to do, to take what we're not supposed to take. So how do we fix that? So that's what Rosh Hashanah is really about. A long year, imagine it's a long year goes by and you've had a lot of time to drift off course, right? Imagine a boat that's missing an anchor. You know, the waves come and pull it in all kinds of directions and if you leave it for a long enough time, it disappears. It's, it's, it's extremely lost. We can get very, very lost. God says, you know what? If I leave you your entire life, 70, 80 years, getting lost, so you'll get so lost, you won't even realize you're lost, and you'll never find your way back. So every year God says, you know what, I'm coming back. Like in the story, every, every so often, I'm coming back, and let's see where you are. It's a time where God is more revealed, and we remember that He's here. And it's a time for us to, to take a, an accounting of what we did, how we got lost, what, how lost were we, and how do we find our way back. This is called the process of tshuva, of repentance. And really, it means to return. Return back to who and what we are and where we're supposed to be. And in doing so, God kind of appears from in front of our eyes. Like He disappeared and He reappears because when we do tshuva, when we return to where we're supposed to be, then we realize that God really was there all along. And that's really connected to the very first story in, in the Torah that where God says to Adam after the first mistake, the first turn off course, with the, the, the tree of, the, of knowledge of good and evil, the forbidden fruit. So God comes and says to Adam, Ayeka, where are you? Of course God knew where he was. What was he really telling him? Where are you? Adam was lost. Adam no longer was able to perceive and see exactly where God was. So he was telling him, if, you, if you're disconnected from me, then you're lost. Where are you? Meaning that you're lost. It's not, I'm, I'm not trying to find you. you. You have to find yourself. And in doing so, you, you'll find me. He wasn't saying that, that I can't find you because you're lost. He's saying you can't find yourself because you're lost. And how do we find ourselves? How do we come back to where we're supposed to be? Back to ourselves is tshuva. The process of tshuva. Let's appreciate it a little bit. The symbol of Rosh Hashanah is the shofar. That is the main symbol of Rosh Hashanah. I mean, it's the day of judgment. It's the apple with the honey. According to Kabbalah, it should be sugar, not honey. You know, you got the, 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 the head of a, of, a, of, a, of a lamb. We got a lot of nice things on Rosh Hashanah, a lot of good food. 
it's like a happy, sad day. It's a day of judgment. But the symbol, the overwhelming symbol in everyone's mind in a certain vision is the shofar. What is the shofar all about? We take that shofar and we blow it on Rosh Hashanah. It is the special mitzvah of the day that is unique to Rosh Hashanah. So the, the, the rabbis tell us a little bit about this shofar. And let's appreciate it. Through the, through the shofar, we're going to appreciate what Rosh Hashanah is all about. And what tshuva is all about. Because the, the shofar is a symbol for tshuva, for return, for our return. So the word shofar means to improve. Leshaper in Hebrew means to improve. Okay? So the shofar represents self-improvement. What else does the shofar teach us? What else do we, do we see from the shofar? So, the Gemara tells us that what a kosher shofar is, and from the vision and the details of that instruct, those instructions, we're going to kind of learn what the shofar is all about. So the, the, so the Gemara says that, that a kosher shofar, in size-wise, is if you take the shofar, you put it in your hand, and it protrudes from both sides. And the literal language of the Gemara is when you look, when you can hold the shofar in your hand and look this way and that way, sort of is forward and backwards of the shofar and see both ends, that's a kosher shofar. Now, what are the sages trying to hint to us aside from the fact of how big the shofar needs to be? I think, I think this is one of the very powerful, meaningful idea that we're going to glean from this, is this. The hands are always in, in, in Torah represent action, right? Holding the shofar in your hand could mean holding tshuva in your hand because the shofar is tshuva, the sh shofar is self-improvement. And so when you're trying to do teshuva, when you're working on returning to the true you, and you're trying to improve yourself and bring yourself closer to Hashem, which is what tshuva is, that's holding on to the shofar because your hands are the actions represent actions that you're going to do to accomplish this. What are we being told to do? So we're being told to look at the shofar, and meaning understand and ponder the process of tshuva. You have to look, uh, we'll start with backwards. You have to look backwards, and you have to look forward. That's an important part of tshuva. Why? So let's understand. According to halacha, and according to all, all sources, the process of tshuva is this. A person's not perfect. So we'll take, for example, a person messed up. He made a sin or he made a mistake. And now he's looking back. He has to first look back at his, his past. We look back at the past year, even the past day. We look back and see, what did I do wrong? The first step of correction and improvement is to realize that there's something to correct and improve. You look back, and if you find a mistake, you find... A, a, a very simple sin, a person woke up late and missed praying. A person took something that he wasn't supposed to. These are all examples of that. So you, the first step of tshuva is to look back and recognize what you must do tshuva for. That's going back in time. You look back and you see what you messed up on. That's step one of tshuva. What does that come with? That comes with a process, which needs to be that I recognize what I did is wrong. I regret and feel bad that I did it. And, I'm, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I put myself through a process, a negative process of, of self-judgment, which is harsh. But there's a beautiful benefit in this self-judgment. When I judge myself, I spare myself of judgment from above, which can be harsher. If we take responsibility, then what does God have to come and do? If we avoid responsibility, run away from responsibility, responsibility then in heaven they come and say, look what you did, and you deserve to be punished. But if I myself look back and, get, and take responsibility, and, and I punish myself, so to speak, I, I recognize and I put myself through a process where I've, I've, I've grown from that mistake, then all that's left for, to do from the heaven's perspective is, is nothing. Because I've done it already. So that's how tshuva saves you from punishment and brings you back to Hashem. So the first step is to recognize the mistake and to regret it and to feel bad about it. Almost to, we don't really cry today, but to, to really feel, how could I do that? Now, there are levels of fear and levels of this process. You could be afraid that you'll be punished, which is the, 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 the basic level. Or you could just feel so terrible that you went against Hashem 
and you caused a sever, you severed and, 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 and has of course a little bit of, of a break in the relationship. You've broken something on some level. And you've disconnected and you've distanced yourself from Hashem. All of this is proper in this looking back. But that's step one. As we look forward, we come to the present. In the present, which is where you are holding on to this concept of tshuva, is the present. You have to now have a resolve, to, right now, to abandon the past behavior, to, 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 to leave the sin, to abandon the sin, and a further resolve, never to return to that sin again. And furthermore, you look to the future now, the other end, the future, in this unbelievable new opportunity to come back to Hashem and to be beloved in Hashem's eyes and to connect back with Hashem and live a life with Hashem. So the three steps to tshuva are past, present, and future. And all this is represented in the shofar that I'm holding, which is a symbol of self-improvement, of repentance, of return. So what we're really saying now, and let's appreciate, hold the shofar in your hand, contemplate. It's time to do tshuva. Look back, regret, and then look to the present, resolve. And of course now look to the future because now it's time to reconnect and come closer. And Hashem has open arms ready to receive you the moment you even start this process. It's, his arms are already opened receiving you and accepting you in Teshuvah. So we see the beautiful symbolism here and message is this. Teshuvah kind of connects past, present, and future all into one. It's a powerful, powerful tool which precedes creation. God says that I created chuva before I created the world because I knew that you're ultimately going to fall and fail. People are not perfect. I know that you're not going to be perfect. The question is, what do you do after you fall? When you work back, work to come back, get up, and, and, and come back to where you need to be, I, I'm, or, I'm already accepting you before you even start. And that's the process of tshuva. Past, present, and future. And the power of tshuva is so strong since it, it precedes creation, it's not really limited to time. That's how come we see tshuva functions in all time frames past, present, and future, because it's able to go back and erase the, the sin on some level, as if it was never done. If you do a full tshuva, the sin even becomes erased. Which the highest level of tshuva is a tshuva from deep, deep love. And that has a power to erase the sin. And even more than that, the ultimate power of tshuva is to transform the actual sin itself into a merit, into, into, into a reward, which is unbelievable. This is the kindness of Hashem. Let's go one step further and appreciate what the chauffeur shows us in an even deeper sense. Because we, we left out at this point the emotional part of this process. And let's get a little bit more into the emotions that we go through in life. Looking at the chauffeur again, let's appreciate. When we blow the chauffeur, we make different kind of sounds. We make a long, drawn-out sound, a takiyah. And we make broken sounds. Teru'ah uh, is a broken sound. And shvarim, which literally means broken. Shever is from the word to be broken. So we make broken sounds, very broken, and we make less broken sounds. Teruah and Shvarim. And so the shofar has three different sounds. Two are in the category of broken up sounds, different levels of brokenness. And the, the, the one long sound that's unbroken. So now let's appreciate. These sounds can, can relate to the two sides of the shofar visually now. There is a wide, open part of the shofar where the sound comes out of. And there is a narrow side that, 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 that you blow into of the chauffeur. And this is also past and future. The narrow side is the past, and the open side is the future. Why? Because ultimately the end result of tshuva is the happiness and goodness that is the result. And the beginning process is the brokenness and the sadness that it starts with. And so the past is the brokenness and the sadness and the self-judgment and the regret. And the future is the unbelievable happiness in this new connection that you're developing with Hashem, which is love and goodness and happiness. And this is also found in the sounds of the shofar. Because we're exp we explained by the sages that the broken sounds of the shofar represent crying, the sound of crying, sobbing, different levels of crying. And the unbroken sound represents joy and happiness. And so now we see the, the, the full range of emotion it starts off with the tears of sorrow and ultimately ends in the highest, highest level with tears of joy. An unbroken tears of joy which is infinitely greater. And that's a process that we have to put ourselves through. When we put ourselves through the regret, the remorse, the, the so to speak, crying, the sadness, 
and go through the whole process and re- reach the full ultimate joy, which is unbroken, tears of joy, which is the ultimate, that's how we reach that high level. You, you cannot reach the high level if you don't start at the bottom. Fixing sin and fixing failure means doing the, the, the dirty work. You have to roll up your sleeves and do the work. When you do the tough work, you reap the unbelievable rewards. And so there is no shortcut. You can't just ignore the fixing. You know, you broke something. You can't ignore it. You have to fix it. And that's part of our growth and our process. We're taught that the, the, the righteous person falls seven times and rises. We fall and we rise. The point is not in falling. Falling is not failure. Let's not be convinced by what the world teaches you. Giving a poor performance doesn't mean you failed. It means there's room for improvement. It's what do you do after you fall. If you fall and you quit, then you failed. But if you fall and you work to get up, even if you're not fully successful in that rise, that's still not failure, that's success. We have to understand that there's a relative success. As long as you're trying, you're a, you're a winner, you're a success. A relative success. We cannot look to others to convince ourselves that we're failures. We cannot rate and gauge our success based on others. We have to look within and realize, I tried, I'm trying. Hashem, God sees that. God knows that and God feels that. And as long as I'm sincerely trying, I'm a winner in Hashem's eyes because He's not expecting perfection. And He's not comparing me to someone else because each one of us is different. And Hashem knows that. And so we have to not hide from the process because we have to understand that is the only way for us to recognize the true winner within. Irrelevant of how much we actually externally succeed. In God's book, the A for effort is the most important grade. I remember growing up in school, you get, you get a couple of grades there. You get, the, you get the actual accomplishment, and you get the effort. In school, the effort grade means nothing. Certainly in the work world, it means nothing. In God's world, the effort department means everything. Because that's the real true test. Because God creates situations that we almost can't succeed sometimes. And He's really looking at how devoted we are, not in the ultimate accomplishment. This is a relative statement. We can't disregard reality. We have to avoid sin. We have to do the good things and the right things. But ultimately, in God's world, that A for effort is what it's all about. And He gives those A's out based on the person. We all can have that A, which is the A that really matters in our relationship with Hashem and our day of judgment on Rosh Hashanah. It's that A that matters, and He's giving those out very easily because He loves us and He's with us. That's the important thing to remember. And that's the real... Highlight of this discussion of return, of tshuva, of repentance. It's not, oh, you sinned. Uh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta scream at yourself. You gotta, you gotta kill yourself because you sinned. No, it's Hashem loves you. He loved you before you sinned. He loves you when you sinned. He loves you after you sinned. And for that perspective, we have to know that we have to make our effort. And the A is already there. Hashem is on our side. And we want Him to judge us. We're more harsh on ourselves than Hashem, to be honest with you. You could be a, a, a worse enemy than you, than you can imagine. Don't look at yourself worse than Hashem looks at you. Don't be, you, don't be your, 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 your accusing angel on yourself more than Hashem accuses you. Hashem loves you. Hashem's on your side. Hashem believes in you. The question is, do you believe in yourself? And if you do, this process becomes an unbelievable, beautiful process of coming home. Coming home to yourself and to a home with Hashem. I think that's an important lesson that we have to take with us. It's, on one hand, we talk about Rosh Hashanah being a very, very intense day, a very intimidating day, a very fearful day, but ultimately, underneath all those garbs, all those external garments, the root of Rosh Hashanah is that God loves us. That's how we got here, that's why we got here, and that's why we're still here. That God absolutely, unconditionally loves and accepts us.